Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration of the great outdoors. Our guest today is Pat Ray. Pat is an outdoor enthusiast, a freelance writer, an accomplished author, and a photographer. Pat, welcome to the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Thank you, Howard. I appreciate the invitation. Fantastic. And, and for our listeners, and again, in the spirit of full disclosure, I do a lot of disclosures like that almost <laughs> week after week. But I, I met Pat this past October at the Outdoor Writers Association of America's annual conference in J Peak, Vermont. All the colors were wonderful out there and had a chance to get to know Pat. We had this long walk up and down a hill between the conference and the eating venue. And so Pat was one of those guys that I was hoping would, would help me out if I couldn't get, get up that hill. But Pat, again, it's so great to see you again. Thank you. So, you know, hey, you just got back from a little outdoor adventure. So chat a little bit about that. Well, I went chucker hunting, and a lot of people don't know what chuckers are because they're they're found really only only in the eleven western states. But they are a species of of part of partridge that uh, uh, has become very numerous and very well set in the in the high desert country of of eastern Oregon and other western states. They're extremely challenging to to hunt because they involve long climbs and um, high elevations and 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 birds that are not very very helpful very cooperative let's say and so it's it's always a big challenge but the enjoyment really is in covering ground covering beautiful ground and the desert doesn't give itself up very well to people that drive through but if you take the time to hike it and and learn about it and pay attention to the signs it's a beautiful, beautiful place, and the, and the the birds are a wonderful addition. Now, you've shared a couple things, and one of them is like, I didn't know that. I had no idea there was like a high desert in Oregon. Yeah, you know, the southeast portion, particularly of, of Oregon, borders into what's called the uh, Great Basin. And the Great Basin is in, incorporates parts of Utah, Nevada, California, and Oregon. And and the Great Basin is called that because it uh, well, it, to put it bluntly, water comes in, but it don't go out. You know, there are no rivers running out of the Great Basin to anywhere. And uh, and it's it's a challenging unforgiving place for people who are not prepared but it is uh really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter so it's it's a it's a great place to be now did you grow up in oregon uh, in and near this area where in the in the high desert or is this like a, little, a commute for you to get yeah you know i i owe it's one of my great regrets is not having been born to and raised in in Oregon, but I was born to a military family. My father was in the Marine Corps and we moved around a great deal. I actually did not come to Oregon until I resigned my commission in the active duty Marine Corps in 1982 and moved my family out here. So my son and daughter, although they weren't born here, have have had the benefit of, of being raised in Oregon and and so they get the full benefit. So you're making up for a lot of lost time and taking full advantage of it now. I'm trying. And, you know, one of the things that I missed growing up as an, as a, an itinerant uh, military brat, if you will, you know, was not having a, a home to go back to, you know, not having a place to call home, really. It, it had benefits in that it made me very adaptable and capable of fitting into different cultures. But it, you know, you, you lose something in not having a real hometown, and I, I'm very glad to have been able to provide that to my kids. Fantastic! Now this adventure of going hunting, and and now I, I fully realize when we were walking up and down that hill three times a day, 
and, and Jay Peak, that 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 little walk probably for you is the equivalent of like a walk in the park. Well, I I don't I'm no uh, triathlete, you know, or anything of that nature, and and carry a few more pounds than I should be, but 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 I do get around okay in in the high desert, and and it tends to be steep, rocky country with sagebrush and and uh, a lot of places that are you know best to avoid if you will but but let's just say i do things the same things that i always did that i did when i was in my 30s but they're just a whole bunch slower <laughs> <laughs> i get that i get that i'm curious you know i realize too pat we're, we're kind of going off on a tangent and i'm i'm entirely okay with this because it was i'm the one that took us off on this tangent but i just love this story about this adventure and I want to hear more about you, but let's keep on this story for a little bit, okay? Sure, sure. So when you were, how do you prepare for this type of, this hunting excursion? I mean, do you, I'm assuming, by the way, you're not going out there by yourself. You've got people with you. Well, uh, we'll come back to that. It's a little bit of a sore point in my family. But okay. in, in terms of preparation, there are, you know, a number of things you can do uh, to to get ready. A lot of the mistakes that people make, hunters make, is thinking that the, because they've gone out and hunted quail or pheasant or white-tailed deer, that they're prepared for the kind of country and the kind of exertion required in, in chucker hunting. And, and very often they are d badly surprised, let's say. Okay. And there's a, there's a very high percentage of hunters that go chucker hunting one time and one time only. By the way, you're, you're chatting with somebody who's never been hunting in his life. So <laughs> go ahead. There are some people, though, that uh, chucker hunting just strikes a chord, and as it did with me. And I, I think I'm alluded to the fact that I didn't start hunting chuckers until I was in my mid 30s. So, but all, and it, and it hurt. I'm, I, I, I came back and was practically comatose for a couple of days, but the, the, the draw of it was, was difficult to escape. I, I just kept going back and going back and, and gradually got into the kind of shape that requ it required and gradually began to look at the, when you do that, you know, when you're, when every thought that you're having does not revolve around how much everything hurts in your body. Then you can kind of pay attention to the land and to the critters and, and the, the scat that you find and the tracks that you find. And it becomes a, a wonderful experience. You know, I can imagine you have some wonderful photographs, which, by the way, I am going to ask you again towards the end of the podcast, perhaps after, if you wouldn't mind sharing some photos of your adventures of you know, in, in the high desert of the chuckers. And, and, and by the way, when you're going hunting, do you have a faithful companion with you that has four legs and fur? Yes, I generally have always had hunting dogs. Started out with a Labrador retriever who was a wonderful dog, but most labs are not, not built for that kind of country and it breaks them down pretty quickly. And so I went into with... Uh, English pointers, and they're wonderful and, and perfectly adapted to chucker. But they're such big runners that it's it's hard to control them in that sort of mountainous country when you lose sight of things that can, are almost sometimes only 50 or 100 yards away. So I've gravitated toward uh, German short hairs, and I have two now. One's 10 years old, and the other one is uh, three, and you know, I really good dogs, really good dogs, and 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 certainly enhances the experience of chucker hunting. When and by the way, what are the names of the dogs? My older dog is Silky. My younger one is Bailey. Well, we definitely want to see a picture of Silky and Bailey. You bet. So when you went out, how many days did you go out? you know, for, for the uh, chucker hunting? Yeah, we went out for three three hunting days. It, it okay. take, takes me the better part of a day to get out there and a better part of a day to get back. 
Okay. But I have full, three full hunting days. And and to be honest with you, if you hunt hard for most of the day, that's about as much as I can take. Okay. Okay. Now, assuming that you were successful on the hunt, you now have some fowl birds in, in, in a container somewhere, or a satchel or whatever, however you, however you keep them. What do you do then? Well, you, you clean them in the field, generally, field dress them in the field, and, and then you bring them home and fix them in any number of different ways. There's, chuckers are a wonderful eating bird. They're very uh, delicate. They're white meat. And, and they can be fixed in every anything from, you know, baking by themselves to uh, being put in stir fries or, or almost anything. It's a wonderful eating bird. What is your favorite recipe? My wife and I generally will fix them in, uh, in uh, a stir fry of any number of different things. You know, snow peas or, or any anything that. Anything that that tastes good will go well with chuckers. Okay. Okay. Now, one, I think, last question is you're going off for three days. So you've got uh, a a pack of some sort. You've got your rifle ammunition. You've got the the dogs. You've got whatever you need to take care of them. How do you camp during those three days so that you're safe, dry, hopefully warm? Yeah, good question. Um, in a lot of the times, particularly in the late season, late November to to the end of January, I don't generally camp out. I generally get a, in a motel room in a small town nearby and work from there. But in the early season, when it's still, the temperature is still reasonable and it's not going to be sleeting on you constantly, then we can set up a a camp of almost any sort. We've done things like, you know, the big old wall tent and a and a cook tent and and the whole shooting match. But there have also been times when I've gone out for three days when I knew the weather was going to be good, when all I took was a bedroll and a sleeping bag, and throw it out on the ground and get up and start hunting and come back and go to bed again. <laughs> oh my God! I, I mean, I can imagine just laying down there at night. And just the stars are just kind of your blanket. That's, that's exactly right. In that high desert, the stars are a lot closer to you than than under normal circumstances. Okay, so I'm I'm like thinking right now, Pat. I want to I want to go out with you now. I need to get in shape. <laughs> but I want to. Uh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, it's an it's a, a wonderful experience, and and I you know I think I wish most people could do it. Yeah, the truth is that, you know, even among the people that get out into this part of the world, the Western states, they have, uh, let's put it this way, the, the numbers are limited by a bunch of different things. Number one, they want to have to hunt, right? Number two, they want to hunt in, in the desert, which doesn't always appeal to people. Number three, they, wanna, they have to want to hunt a very challenging bird that's going to require them to go up and down a thousand, twelve hundred, or more feet, and then down again, up again, and and so that really starts limiting <laughs> the numbers of folks that want to be chucker hunters, which which kind of impacted my the sales of my first book, which was a chucker hunter's companion, and it was it has sold really really well in a small niche market, but when I did my research, I realized that there were less than a hundred thousand chucker hunters in the whole United States. And and when you consider that a guy that might write a, a book about pheasant hunting or white-tailed deer hunting, there are literally millions of hunters of those species. So for, for 100,000 uh, hunt, hunters of chuckers, then I'd have to do pretty well in a, in a small niche market like that. But luckily, the book was extremely well uh, received and and a pretty high percentage of the of the relatively high percentage of the chucker hunters have purchased that book and done well with it i love it that's fantastic and you know i what i love too is just it's in your voice is the sense of adventure 
and the passion, the love, and, and it's something you look forward to every season. And, and I, I think, you know, I, I talk to people every week through my career coaching and some folks are just like, they love what they do on the, on one end. And then the other end, you know, it's a J-O-B. It's like, I, I don't like it, but it pays my bills. And my feeling is whatever you do, you have to enjoy. You've got, it has to be something that brings you joy in your life. And you also have to have room in your life besides the job the career. You also have to have something that you're passionate about outside that, that gives you, you know, that drive and like, I got to get out and do and do this. And I mean, that's what I hear, you know, in your voice and the enthusiasm about the, the checker hunting. So thank you for that. You bet. I think so, you would find that true of, of most chucker hunters, probably more so than than hunt the general run of the mill hunters of other species. I'm thinking, you know, for you know, even a couple, you know, hundred thousand or so, I think you could you could have your own Chuckers Hunters podcast if you wanted to. <laughs> you know, I the the truth is that that I tried to do something like that in the beginning. Uh -huh. I wanted to promote the book. I wanted to I wanted to kind of contribute to a community of chucker hunters, if you will, and and help folks because, you know, when you're first starting out in chucker hunting, unless you've got somebody to kind of give you some pointers, you're likely to get yourself into a jam or two before you straighten things out. So I hoped that, that the website was going to do that. And it was doing it. It was, it was going great, you know, going great guns, but I really hated it. <laughs> I, I hated the kind of effort that it took on a daily basis to to keep it up. And although yeah. I enjoyed communicating with other chucker hunters, I did not want to communicate with them, you know, seven days a week. Right. And 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 I finally, you know, just I and I'm not proud to say this, but I I basically bailed on it. I you know left it alone. There's other people that are doing something like that now. But but I, I I don't have the psychological profile to to be a podcaster or a blogger or whatever. Yeah, well, who somebody once said some famous actor in a scene you have to know your limitations. Man's got to know his limitations, and so <laughs> yeah, this would like I love the podcast. I love interviewing the guest and asking questions. It's the production that you know and i have responsibility for some of that now because we're looking for an, a new editor but it's like you know every episode that i podcast it, it, people don't realize it, it, this 45 minutes to an hour you and i are going to be chatting that's just one little piece of it <laughs> right <laughs> so, yeah I've, I've talked with other friends who have you know experienced the same thing and and I and some of them do it very well and continue to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of those people. Sure. I'd rather write my books. There you go. Now, I, I know you spent time in, in the Marines. You were a, a helicopter pilot, which that could have been a whole episode in and of itself, Pat. But you, uh, you eventually went on in your career when, you know, after re retiring from, the, from active duty to be an information officer at the Oregon uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And in that question, I'm also curious, when did this love of writing begin to take hold for you? <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I went into Marine Corps, obviously, uh, during a period in, in Vietnam when the choices were, were fairly limited. And my choice came down to the Army or the Marine Corps, and my father was a Marine, and, you know, it's a genetic flaw. So yes, I joined it the is. Marine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I joined the Marine Corps and, and found myself in aviation and actually really loved it. I loved the Marine Corps. I loved flying helicopters. Helicopters are world's finest toy, I swear they are. Yeah, I can imagine. So, but, you know, I, I, I spent a year, 13 months away from my family in the early 70s and overseas. And when I came back, 
I really wasn't interested in leaving my family again. I, I left my two-year-old daughter for a year. And so even in the regular Marine Corps, when you're not mounting out to combat or extended deployments, you are gone from your family a lot. And I did not, as much as I like the Marine Corps, as much as I like flying, I did not want to do that. And so I resigned my commission when I was still in Pensacola as a flight instructor. And, and, and just prior to that, for the couple of years prior to that, I decided, well, I ought to get something out of being in the Marine Corps rather than learning how to fly helicopters and the associated combat-related things. So I went back to school at the University of West Florida and worked on a, and received a, a master's degree in American literature. And during that period of time, I loved that stuff. I'd always been an inveterate reader. I loved reading and 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 writing to that for that matter, but I never considered it as a career until I started really doing in-depth work on in American literature. And at that at that point, hubris reared its ugly head, and I began to think, you know, what does Steinbeck and Hemingway and Faulkner have on me really? And so <laughs> I <laughs> and so I resigned my commission took my family out to Oregon and became a freelance writer. And, and that, at that point, I learned that you can, you can be a good writer, but you also have to, you know, you have to support your family. And so I found myself writing lots and lots of articles for outdoor magazines, anything, anything that anybody would pay for, I wrote. And, and when you do that, you don't have a lot of time to put in on, you know, great literature. <laughs> you're you're trying to pay the bills and you're cranking out copy. And and so after seven years, oh, and I told my wife at that point, who was very nice to support me in all of this. She, I told her, well, listen, if I'm not rich and famous by the time I'm 40, I'll get a real job. So when when my birthday came around age 40, <laughs> I decided I better get a real job. And I did that, luckily, with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And it was served there as an information officer and an information supervisor for 13 years. And then went back to freelancing, which I learned was much more productive and much more lucrative after I'd spent a lot of time you know, with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and, and writing for them sure. as well. Sure. How did you get introduced to the Outdoor Writers Association of America? I wrote, I, I, one of the things you learn pretty quickly about freelance writing is it's, you know, one of the world's most loneliest professions. You have no connection to anybody. You are doing uh, interviews with people outside of your your profession, and you're basically sending information. You're sending your product to an editor somewhere, and and you don't have an opportunity to get any feedback from anyone. And so, I started searching around, and there was an established outdoor writer, very well established outdoor writer in Oregon, Bend, Oregon, named Ed Park, and I wrote to Ed. And said, you know, I'm sort of lost here. Can you give, give me some guidance? And he said, well, the first thing you got to do is join the Outdoor Writers Association of America. And then he proceeded to mentor me for a couple, three years or more, actually. And, and then that was my first introduction. That was about 1984. And I've been in that organization ever since. And for someone that is not a dedicated joiner, of things that's pretty remarkable in my time almost you know pushing pushing 40 years in that organization and of course i just finished up as uh my stint as president of the organization which was very gratifying but basically ed showed me and i learned very quickly that not only is it important as to provide a sense of co community within the people that you 
you you share work and 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 struggles with, but it it's a, op- a great opportunity to learn. You know, those conferences. I have never gone to one of those conferences, and I think I've gone to thirty two or thirty three of them, without l- l- leaving with a whole notebook full of ideas and a whole notebook full of of po- pointers and tips to make my writing better. So it's just been an exceptionally fruitful connection for me over that time. Yeah, thank you for that uh, answer. And I will say I, I I love those little journalist notebooks that they gave out during the conference. And I was just filling mine like crazy. And and to your point, there were definitely some epiphanies for me. And so I can appreciate that. Pat, what advice would you give to an aspiring freelance writer today? Let's say they are looking to write in the outdoor space like you. What advice would you give them? Well, I I would have to temper my answer with the caveat that things have changed a lot since I jumped into the business. Number one, the outdoor space in the newspapers has diminished by a significant amount, probably in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 percent less opportunity for for writing in in newspapers as as the newspapers have declined as advertising has declined. And of course, that's how I started out is introducing myself to the local newspaper editor and saying, look, I'm I'm pretty good. Here's a little story. What do you think? And from there, I became a columnist over time for more than 25 years with the paper. But there are still lots of outlets. Newspapers might not be the best one. There's still plenty of, of magazines. And of course, the the opportunity in the digital world is is something that I I'm not an expert at, but I do know there are a lot of people doing great things with, with blogs and podcasts and the like. So my, my first advice to them would be go down or order a copy of The Writer's Market. It's a book designed for freelancers that I used as a text when I taught freelance writing and, and journalism at Oregon State University and, and other online universities. That's the first thing I'd tell them. Second thing is be prepared for failure and don't let it get to you. Be, what's the term? Um, it starts with a P, but at any rate, what it boils down to is persistent. Don't, huh? Persistent? Yes, thank you. That's You're it. welcome. <laughs> be persistent. Don't get disgusted or discouraged stay at it. And the third thing I tell them is remember that everybody in this business stays in the business in one form or another. So the people that you meet that might be aspiring freelance writers right now could 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 well be the editor of the big newspaper or or magazine that you want to write to write for 10 years from now. So so keep everybody in mind, stay, uh, maintain your connections and your network and stay with it. I love that. Thank you for sharing. And the book again is The Writer's Market? Yes. Oh, great. We'll provide a backlink to it yeah. in the show notes. Pat, you wrote the another book called Corvallis Reflections. And I'm thinking Corvallis is where you, the beautiful home in Oregon, where you and your yes. wife live. You raise your yes. family. Yeah, it's a town in the mid Willamette Valley, and I have lived here gladly. I consider myself very, very lucky to have lived here since 1982. So during that period, I think I mentioned I'd been writing for the newspaper, both outdoor columns and general interest columns for many years. And at one point, I decided with some urging to consolidate a number of the better columns into a book. And that's, that's what's uh, referred to as Corvallis Reflections. 
I love it. I love it. Yeah. Real nice, real nice book about a great town. Excellent. You know, I moved from, well, I grew up in the Detroit suburbs. I lived in Montgomery, Alabama for a year and I've lived elsewhere in apartments, but I wouldn't necessarily quote unquote, call them home. And then last July, I moved to Las Vegas. And so now I am so close to the West. Oh, I'm in the West, but the <laughs> desert, Great Basin National Park, and I'm close to Oregon. And it's like, and, and I met a uh, photographer that's up in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State. She, I met her via Danielle Taylor from the OWAA with, through her new work on the photo, digital photography journal. So this young lady is like 18 years old and she's like a phenomenal photographer. And I had her as a guest recently. And I'm thinking to myself, I have got to continue to explore you know, out here. I mean, and just Oregon is definitely one of those places. Let's talk about your, your latest book, The Gift of the Grenadier. This was a novel that was released in 2017. Tell us more about that. The Gift of the Grenadier is a... Uh... It's a difficult novel to describe, actually, which it always caused me trouble when I tried to sell it to an agent or a publisher. But, but it basically revolves around the impact of, of an, an horrific injury, a masculating injury of a, of a, of a Marine in Vietnam. And, and it, it follows that man and the impact that it affected, the effect it had, had on him and his family, and his circle of friends, and a kind of an ever-widening circle of, of impacts, if you will. And the, it, there's, it's heavily influenced both by uh, military background and by the outdoors. A lot, of the, a lot of the settings within the book have an outdoor connection as as do the the military connections as well there are several scenes in the book and several events that occur to some of the characters that that either happened to me or happened to my friends and and in the central issue of the book is kind of pulled out of a uh headline from 20 years ago so it's it's a book that is based chronologically in in, uh, subs, in the years subsequent to Vietnam, but it's far more timely than that. I don't think that it's dated in that way. And I, my wife says that it's a little dark and a little violent, and and I tell her that, well, you know, that, that's that part of the world and that and that group of people and. I, I think that it, uh, I think I mentioned in your, your notes that I consider it the best book that most people have never re heard of. So <laughs> I, hope, I hope that people will take the opportunity to, to read it. It's a, I'm proud of it. Well, we're definitely going to provide the, the links back to your website and to the book page uh, on Amazon. So whatever we can do to help promote the book. And, you know, it's like, your other writing, there's definitely, you know, the passion of what you put into your work, into your loves, the uh, the town, the chucker hunting. I mean, it definitely uh, comes through as well. So when you're not hunting chuckers or doing continue, are you continuing to do freelance writing or are you, what are you doing these days? I was going to the OWA conference. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm working on as another novel. I think that I have found my calling. I wish that I had started writing fiction and writing novels when I was in my teens. I wish that's the biggest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm 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 trying to get as much out as I can in the time I got left. And and the truth is, and I tell I tell people this that. I, there's not much, a lot more fun than sitting around your house in your sweatpants making stuff up. <laughs> the life of a fiction writer, and 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 I'm never happier than when I'm in the midst of a, of a a, 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 a dialogue between characters. I love the the interaction between characters. To me, 
the uh, the development and establishment and following of characters is the very best part of fiction and and so i really have fun doing that fantastic now i've got a question and i've asked this with uh, some other authors that i have interviewed and and for our guests as i'm chatting with pat I, I'm, I'm in I don't know, an office, a bedroom, somewhere in his home. He's sitting in a really comfortable looking easy chair. There's a nice fleece or lamb's wool padding behind him. And it, I'm telling you folks, this looks comfortable. My question, Pat, is where's your favorite place to just kind of sit back and get creative to write? Um, I have an office downstairs and I have a, you know, an office chair where I do the, the administrative business of being a writer and, and, and bank accounts and all of the associated things like that. But when it comes to creative writing, I do it right here in this layback. I don't I think it's, I guess it's a lazy boy chair of some sort and, and with a laptop on my, on my lap. And that's what, that's, that's where I am. You know, it's, it's fun doing it that way. I love it. And now I'm I'm going to make an assumption that your wife is enjoying this part of your life because when she needs to get you out of her hair, she she can just say, "Go up to your room and write." <laughs> well, I think we, my wife and I, have been married for I think 51 years now, and and so we've we've found the balance in our relationship in a lot of ways. But, but one of the, one of the things that uh, was a challenge, really, and I think uh, other people have had this happen as well, is, well, if one of you retires and the other one's not retired, then, you know, there's a, an issue of how you connect. And, and in, in our case, Deb was working as a school teacher. I was freelancing, so that was great. She was gone. I was working. When she came, when she retired and came back home and was, you know, doing things and I'm in the office or I'm up here and, and I'm working, <laughs> it doesn't look like I'm working, but I'm working. And, and she would come in and say, well, what, what do you want to do today? <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm working here. So it, luckily we, we worked that part of it out and and continued on, you know, but it's just a balanced thing. And she, she, I, she's very supportive in my writing and, and works hard to make sure I have the time. Fantastic. And she helps cook up that uh, phenomenal stir fry with the chocolate. Yeah, she, she's a real good cook. Fantastic. Well, I'm definitely, I'm going to be an opportunistic podcaster. You just, you wait. Yeah. Come up and see us and we'll feed you. All right. So I have a question and this is a little bit of a I don't know, in some ways a gotcha question, but you can handle this. As you look back in your career, the things that you have done, perhaps things you should have done, is there anything you would want to say to your younger self? Oh, that is a good question. Um, yeah, I'm not... I'm not sure that I was as kind and understanding as I would have liked to have been. And, and part of that was that the Marine Corps does not necessarily equip its officers to be kind and understanding very much. And, and there is a tendency to absorb the kind of training that you get in the Marine Corps and, and spread it around in the rest of your life, family included. And, uh, and, and I, 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 if I were looking back now and had the opportunity to straighten out some of the things that I could have done better, that would probably be, be number one, just be a little bit more understanding, a little bit more kind uh, with everyone, you know, family, children, friends, workers, the whole schmear. That's, that would probably be it. And I appreciate your uh, vulnerability there and sharing that with us. Thank you. If our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, Pat, where are the best places for them to go? Well, I think I have 
two website addresses, both of them end up in the same spot. It's patray.com or outdoorinsights.com. Fantastic. And that would be a good start. And from there, if they want to contact me, they can do that as well. I'd be happy to respond. Very good. Well, we will definitely provide the backlinks to patray.com and outdoorinsights.com. And uh, for our listeners, the links to Pat's books are, are there on the website. He can take care of the purchase there. So in this holiday season, that's probably not a bad place to go. We'll also provide a link back to one of those big boxy kind of online big boxy kind of stores as well. <laughs> Pat, it has been a pleasure to spend more time with you. It was, again, it was a pleasure to, to meet and chat with you at the Outdoor Writers Association of America's meeting in Jay Peak and really learn more about you and your work here today and and learning really about your background and the chucker hunting. I'm like, now I'm really intrigued. And just, it's just been a great story to share with our listeners on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. So thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, Howard. And I'll, I'll send you along some of the photos that you requested. Fantastic. Well, hang on the call. We're going to do a quick close and we'll, we'll chat just a few more minutes. Okay. Very good. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with Pat Ray. He is a outdoor enthusiast, freelance writer, author, photographer, and really one of the phenomenal individuals that I had the opportunity and pleasure to meet while attending the Outdoor Writers Association of America's annual conference in Jay Peak Resort out in Vermont. And and I guess, and I'm no joking aside, I mean, I was definitely glad to have a conversation as I'm walking up and down that hill because without the conversation to distract me, I was in pain, but that's a whole other story. Listen, a lot of great information today. We've learned a little bit about chucker hunting. We've learned about, you know, Pat's books on the Corvallis Reflections and really the work that went into the gift of the Grenadier, the novel. And so do take the time to go out and visit Pat's website, outdoorinsights.com or patray.com. We'll provide all the backlinks. Do let us know what you think of today's podcast and uh, give us a comment, a like, share it with your family, your friends, and also do visit us on the our LinkedIn page or uh, Facebook page and well, Outdoor Adventure Series and also on our podcasting platforms. Uh, Buzzsprout um, is our main platform, which then shoots out to Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Audible, and especially Spotify, where we have our Outdoor Adventure Series play playlist. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. Take care of yourselves, your family. Take care of the community and enjoy the beginning of the holiday season. And we will see you on another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care now.